Now, Reid, you're, you're, uh, you landed last night. Indeed. So, well, well so <laughs> hopefully no jet lag. Uh, <laughs> why, does, why does something like this matter? Why does it work for you? You're backing it, you're supporting it. Um, well, I mean, look, so a couple things. So uh, jobs of the future will generally be created by new scale-up uh, institutions. Uh, work is a extremely important part of a person's life, not only obviously economics, but also you know the two spheres in which people derive meaning is a combination of kind of friends and family and work. Uh, and so you need to actually kind of figure out what these kind of industries of the future are. And you know part of what I think is happening is there's more and more uh, quick changes within industry. And so part of the skill set that uh, young people need to learn in order to have effective careers and effective and meaningful work experiences is to participate in these industries of the future. And so precisely what WorkFinder is uh, trying to do is, is create that matching, that, the, where you say, well, here are the interesting scale uh, opportunities of the future, and here's how you get into that flow. And that's actually what is key in the first book I wrote, which is The Startup of You, is essentially pick the networks of the future as part of having a successful career. Right. You often hear, Sherry, that, that young people don't have the skills. They don't have what it is. That's often the common gripe of business. Why should business sit up and take notice in terms of what you're doing? Because they need the skills. Uh, so the number one issue I sort of mentioned it earlier is that when you, you're growing like a, you know, you're growing really, really quickly because you've got a fabulous product, you need to hire people. And if you have a whole bunch of people applying who have skill sets that are not relevant to you, then you can't grow as fast because you either have to hire them and train them, or you can't hire them and you wait and you wait and you wait for somebody who has the skills that you need. And that just isn't good. It's not good for an economy and it's definitely not good for a company. Um, I know the extreme pain from when I was running my own companies and as an investor, the, the first is like, how are we going to get you the talent that you need? Um, mm. So it's, it's absolutely critical. And it's all of our issues. It's also my issue as a, as a parent. I want to make sure that my children take interesting jobs uh, and know how to create interesting jobs in the future. So it's all of our problem. It's not pointing a finger at somebody in school and saying, you're not teaching them the right thing. It's like, well, we can help solve this together. Reid, I, I read in a recent article that you set yourself the mission at LinkedIn is how do you enable as many people to have as many transformative economic opportunities as possible? That is a, there's a great synergy there with what WorkFind is trying to do. What was the answer to your own question? <laughs> um, question? But you asked yourself, how do you? I mean, what, in terms of the <laughs> well, answer, yes. I mean, to some degree, that was creating LinkedIn, right? I mean, there was a reason for that. And, and part of the... I mean, and you know, it shares an intellectual um, basis with the book, The Startup of You, which is to think about what is the way that you're essentially uh, joining kind of what are the, the trends, the skills, the scale-up institutions which are creating those kind of future work. Because industries uh, evolve quickly and they're evolving even more quickly. I mean, for example, take artificial intelligence applying to medicine and how does that make universal uh, accessibility and how does that change how uh, medical practice is done. And so when you're thinking, oh, I'm going to become a doctor, maybe actually, in fact, I'm going to become a doctor and I actually need certain kinds of technical experience. And that's part of what you need to do in order to be successful, uh, in order to have a high impact career. And I think part of the, uh, like part of what, you know, Sherry and, and, and WorkFinder is doing is saying this is a two-sided, um, this is a, essentially a two-sided problem. On one hand, you want the industry saying, here's how we're getting people involved. On the other hand, you need uh, people saying, okay, I need to take a jump, I need to, ex I need to reach out, I need to try to apply to something and find that experience. Now, one thing that in addition to what's been said thus far on stage is there's a social duty, obviously. There's an industry duty, obviously. But the other thing to reflect on as businesses for uh, why this is important for you to do is also think about uh, kind of the um, the mission and the the emotional connectivity of your workforce. Mm. If you're actually providing these kinds of you know uh, project experiences, your workforce is going great. I feel connected. I feel meaningful. So it's an opportunity it. as well yes. as duty. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. Right. It is actually in fact good for your business. So, so let's look at this this issue of opportunity and duty, Cherry. Because you know if you look, I mean, you heard Peter talk about. Um, the sort of the, the, the woeful pickup, if you will. I mean, only 46% of, of businesses, I think, was the figure he said, actually, here in the heart of London. I mean, if you look at the data, the lack of diversity in UK workforces right now is pretty woeful. I mean, 
can, can you get to grips with it? Does, does technology now, has it, has it come to a point where actually the tech can actually solve the problem? Or do, you think, do you think it's a solvable issue? Presumably that's why you're here. I definitely think it's a solvable issue. Um, I think, on, well, there's two things. On the diversity, you, you can use AI to help, to help that. So if it's a girl applying, maybe we want to highlight female-led businesses. You know, we've got 23,000, so it's like, let's, let's just say, well, maybe you want to work for a woman. Um, why don't you find that? So you can, you can make recommendations really, and get inspired by some of the recommendations that LinkedIn use. You can use these technologies to even, even the playing field. Um, for uh, in Manchester and in Birmingham and the and, uh, and Newcastle, um, we're working with those environments to make sure that girls on free school meals have access to digital companies. And that's really important. I grew up in a logging town in Canada. Neither parent went to university. So it's very unexpected that I would be here. But that, and that was the community somehow putting opportunities in front of me that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And we can use technology and AI to mimic that same thing that that community mm. and society in Canada did for me today, but on an iPhone. Or, or an Android, sorry. Either, you, either. You, the platform, you, the platform you, doesn't matter. <laughs> and I'm not sure, I, know, I know you're neutral. Yeah, but uh, the platform doesn't matter. But that, that's really what technology can do, because it's quite time consuming and costly to do that. In an and, and if you haven't got access to that technology, if you're part of the, you know, the digital poverty trap, if you're part of a group of people that feel hopeless right now, What's well, the step that has to be taken? Well, for one thing, I think role models are really, really important. Um, and so on the diversity, having you know, girls take, get work experience in the AI department of Babylon is pretty cool. Um, and you probably met a bunch of other people you know, that you thought were interesting. Well, part of that allows you to give yourself permission to think things that you might not have thought before. Mm. And I think that I would call out to all technology companies, particularly those that em employ women, and make sure that uh, a great number of those women are volunteering. And if you're a woman or you're no woman in tech, please volunteer uh, to host work experience. It's critically important. Um, but it's also fun. Um, the, you know, I started in tech as a computer programmer. I have no idea how that came about 30 years ago. Um, and it actually it was. I was inspired by a woman called, Steph called Stephanie, uh, Dane Stephanie Shirley. And, um, and that opened up a whole world of opportunities, not the boring jobs that my parents didn't like and didn't find fulfilling. Mm. It opened my eyes to the fact that what we do in the companies that we start and that we invest in is actually deeply fun and right. interesting and everybody should have access to that and that energy uh, that, that, that you know it's very fulfilling that and, you can and can that be done really i mean you know if you look at the future world of work i mean I, there's a great piece last year in the financial times which looked at the future and it and it sort of there was an accusing finger at, at the technologists like your good selves here it talked about you know that actually we don't need as many people, that the world is actually fill, filled by techno-fatalists that don't believe that actually AI and so on will lead to more jobs. But if you're a kind of techno-optimist, which was the other uh, opportunity, it was about those new jobs of the future. Give us a sense of what you're seeing. What are people going to be doing in the future? Well, there's a couple different, I mean, the old refrain is uh, technology, okay, those jobs go away. We have uh, less people driving, you know, uh, horse and carriages, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, in fact, technology also creates a lot of jobs. There's a lot of new industries. Uh, the skill sets are different. You need to have internships, work finder experiences, other kinds of things as a way of getting there. I myself am bullish over all of our lifetimes that technology will actually be creating more jobs than it, than it reduces. It isn't to say that maybe at some point there is some kind of science fiction, Isaac Asimov kind of like universe in which robots are doing a lot of things. Yeah. In which case maybe- It's called the Jensen's, isn't it? I think <laughs> yes, <that> exactly. <laughs> in which case, you know, maybe we're being cultural producers and so forth. I mean, it's, it's such a, a distant future, I think it's hard to, uh, to predict well. But I actually think that what will happen is it will be creation of a lot more jobs and a lot more work opportunities that will require more uh, adaptive skills, uh, new skills and kind of adaptability to that, which is why you should be doing internships. Do, do you get a sense from the WorkFinder app of what some of those jobs might be, Sherry? Do you get a sense of like really interesting opportunities that you thought, oh, that's, you know, wouldn't have been here a few years ago. What are the sort of things that you're seeing with the scale-ups, do you think? Well, there are really interesting opportunities. I think there's some, there's some data that I read recently that for every data scientist, uh, there, are, there are 70, there are 70 offers for somebody who knows data science as opposed to 70 people who know how to do data science. So I think if you choose your skill set 
uh, and also have an open mind on how you navigate it. Um, again, the other thing that I think I learned from, from LinkedIn is that between graduating or finishing school and, and retiring, you have something like 25 different identifiable jobs, and those are six or seven different career streams. Um, now, that's fantastic, but it doesn't mean that you prepare for one job and that you think that you do that job mm. until you retire or until you die. Um, we have, if there's 25 jobs going before I retire, I want to know, how do I navigate them? How do I find them? Which is why, if you haven't read Reed's book, you should read your book, because, it, it, again, it's, it's great at helping you understand available at all good retailers. how you navigate How's that? <laughs> yeah, yes, available at all good retailers. But there's and, also, um, a, there's also um, a step up required yeah. for... But you need to change. That, Those job, the old jobs are not there. Right. But, but that doesn't mean there's not jobs there. No, they okay. just need different but, skills. But the role of work experience in preparing yeah. for those jobs. You, you said here that... Um, most work experience is little more than extended lessons in team making, data entry, and envelope stamping. Presumably, that's what Maitri was complaining about. Yeah. And in the old in the old world, I think it was. You know, we'll come and do shadowing and just sit. That's not an interesting or meaningful work experience. Right. But all of us can think about interesting. So, what is project. meaningful work experience? So, think? meaning. So, I think exactly what was being described earlier. So, um, if I think about Maitri, we had her on a project doing uh, doing research for us and creating a report. We had two uh, amazing interns uh, this summer. Uh, actually on, using AI and doing a plot of where all the schools were and where all, actually we did it on a woman one, where all the women-based businesses are because we wanted to ask, we wanted to create an algorithm that contacted the teachers to tell them there were interesting women there for Ada Lovelace Day, um, which we did. And that meant that every teacher got a little note saying, did you know that two miles away from you there's a woman running in a really interesting company and you should, you know, ask her in or go for a workplace visit. So that, you know, those were interesting projects and we needed the skills of those young, of those young people to do those, pro to do those projects for us. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot more interesting than making coffee. You hear you're going to make coffee, you're going to photocopy. You know, well, that's not meaningful. I think we all have it in us to think about something interesting that you can put into a three or five day product, uh, sorry, project or a two week project. When we surveyed the tens of thousands of businesses, they said that a week felt good. It wasn't too big an ask, it wasn't too little an ask. If it was a disaster of a young person, then it was only a week. Mm. Um, so, you know, but it, and it was, it was still a duty, but they felt that they could get interesting, good work out of it. Right, that. so Reed, Cherry's talking a lot about activism here as well, actually getting out there and giving people opportunities. Do you get a sense when you look at sort of global capitalism now that, p that business is listening? I mean, a lot of people feel out of love with it, especially young people, young people leaving schools. I mean, do you, th do you get a sense of the scale-ups that might lead the way out? Well, I think that one of the things that scale-ups, as, as part of the comments that Sherry was making earlier, is they all know that uh, talent that will help learn the new industry, uh, the kinds of new products and services, the new way they're operating is extremely important. And that part of getting that talent, uh, it won't just be like, oh, here's a bunch of people who already know how to do this new kind of disruptive thing. You'll actually have to get people learning it. Right, so uh, a central part of what I invest in is actually not necessarily that people have the complete set of skills in order to do, but that they're actually fast learners. And that part of this is actually to enable uh, learning. So I actually think the new industries, uh, especially, although I think all, um, are focused on uh, how do we get this, this uh, the talent that's learning the future with us. Uh, and so I, th I would say that I'm probably, um, uh, in addition to being a techno-optimist, I'm optimistic about this adaptability about, of businesses. But if you look at something like the Have Us Meaningful Brands Index, it sort of states that consumers wouldn't care less if 74% of the world's businesses drop dead tomorrow. I mean, that's not a, you really don't want to be one of the 74%, do you? <laughs> well, I mean, so they may not care if a specific, like, okay, the manufacturer of this toothbrush, is it a different manufacturer of the toothbrush or not? Doesn't matter, I do need a toothbrush, <laughs> right, as a, as a function. And so I don't think that the goal in any organizational institution is actually, the primary goal is not to live forever. The primary goal is to, is to offer good products and services, offer good work experiences, and it is a natural flow of uh, some of these are growing and some of these shrink and consolidate and go away, and that's actually an okay part of you know, both life and work. Right. Well, it's just, if you think about that, 40% of the GDP is 
is today are from companies that didn't exist 15 years ago. That's our capitalist system. Some companies shrink and go away because they can no longer do what they're supposed to do, and other companies start and grow. Mm. And that's a healthy thing that we should all recognize as a very natural part. I was just thinking about the alliance and about how you approach right. oh, people so working us, for you. Give us a sense, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So yeah. His, his book, The Alliance, really talked about aligning the interests of Somebody person. Somebody in the back there was thinking about Star Wars, but that's the book, right? Oh. That's that. <laughs> also it could be the Rebel yeah. Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> also very good and involves robots uh, but but again I think read uh, so it's, a, it's a ping to talk about it but I think the aligning people's interests that you don't you know you don't expect people to have everything when they arrive but you expect them to be interested in the end of the journey and you align yourself with them for some period of time whether or not that's five years two years or a week if they're if they're younger um, that's what you're doing and you're going on a journey together and that is something that is an, it's a critical aspect of our society and even more so now that the industries are restructuring at a greater velocity than they have historically. So they need people, they need people with potential, potential to be realized. Let's go to the world of education. You know, we already heard from Ali that the sort of, you know, some of the problems of education in terms of, you know, the skills and so on that you leave school with. You're seeking to get more schools involved. Lots of private sector organizations have never really sort of got the other side of that in terms of actually making the difference. What's going to make WorkFinder different? Uh, well, the, I think the, the use of the technology, the fact, I mean, I, Ali, I mean, I want to like one of the things you're doing because you're applying it to the, to the NHS and to the health sector. We use AI uh, and data science very, very aggressively, but apply it to the education sector. Um, there are things that all of us want to do, but have been too time consuming or too expensive to do before, or you just couldn't plain figure it out. Um, but you can, you know, you can write algorithms and make it a lot easier to provide amazing services and amazing recommendations the same way that a really caring or really switched on teacher would I think that the the focus on exams um, it, it, it doesn't help and I think you know in some I know that you, uh, Peter was talking about in London I think 54% of uh, children were getting work experience but outside of London only 8% of women not women sorry the children are getting work work experience and that means they're really not at all prepared for work and if the best and 90% of teachers are saying that the best way to prepare a young child for work is to give them a few tastes at work. Well, if that's the best way, then we've got the capacity up and down the country to do it. Um, the other thing that I'm, which we know, because we can query databases like LinkedIn, which covers most of the company, so, uh, you know, and, and also the government databases. So we know the location of all of the companies. We also know the location of all of the schools. And those companies, we also know whether or not they're growing or shrinking. And we can pull that together right. for the first time. And we don't have to leave it in the hands of a teacher who's not expert in querying databases or knowing. We can all pop it onto an app. You can click a few buttons. You can find the really cool growing businesses around you. And you don't have to do the research. We've just taken all the legwork and research away from the students, the parents, and the teachers. And that allows them to do what they've wanted to do so for a long time. What about the belief? What about the fact of the, you know, the role of teachers in preparing young people for the world of work? Do they have to believe in it? Do they have to see this in terms of where opportunity might lie? Well, where 90, the 90 percent of the 90 percent of teachers in this country say that the best way to prepare a young person for work is getting them work experience. So we're building on the stuff that teachers already told us. Um, this gives them access to the critical assets in their local community that they can't see because they don't have tools that are available to them. These tools are often available to banks, to investors, and to so forth, um, but they're not necessarily available in a, in a compatible way for teachers. So that's why we work with teachers and students for three years to do something that they like. That's why it leads with a map. The kids said, I don't drive. It's like, oh, well, you have to cycle. You've got to cycle. Okay, well, we'll start with a map. So you can find companies on a map. That's not necessarily the way that an investor would go about looking for them, um, but, but they are still there and they're producing the jobs. And if you only, and they might have heard of the big companies, big, but, but those big companies sometimes shrink, sometimes shrink extremely quickly, but they won't have heard of and they don't know how to find the little ones. So this is a way of putting the little ones on the map that have more interesting jobs anyway. Job satisfaction is way higher in small and medium sized companies than the large ones or the professional firms. That's just a fact. So it's giving them access to things they know they've wanted for an ages, but they just didn't have. Right. It's so now technically possible. It wasn't possible before. We should do it. It's so wrong not to. So we've seen the tech. We've seen the ambition. We've got a driving issue of our time. Sherry wants to take this big. 
you've got great experience of what it means to scale, really. If you were to give WorkFinder some, <laughs> well, Sherry's got some views, which she's going to share, but in terms of, in terms of some advice about how WorkFinder could become not only the UK's answer, but potentially a world answer to the future of work experience. If you were to give us a tip, what should happen next? <laughs> uh, well, Sherry and I spend, do spend some time uh, talking about this, and obviously um, this is part of what LinkedIn's been doing, because the question is if you actually get all of the things that are relevant to how people navigate their work experience, kind of digitally represented, what we call at LinkedIn the economic graph. So it's a combination of you know, jobs, skills, other kinds of things, and then people know how to navigate that to their best possible path. That's essentially what the next steps of WorkFinder are, is more companies that say, oh, this is a really important thing for society, uh, for my business, for the morale of my employees, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, engagement with young talent. Uh, and so I'm going to offer these kinds of experiences on WorkFinder. And then uh, obviously for uh, teachers and for students who are like, okay, how am I getting ready for the jobs and the industries of the future? Well, a week is a really great way to begin to get that experience. Mm. Let's just talk a little bit about your own, I mean, we're starting to run out of time a little bit, but your own first steps, your own work experience, if you will. What, what, tell us about your own stories. And how did you get that first bit of experience? Sherry first, perhaps. Uh, well, what was I the said, first working experience job for Sherry? Work experience over my first job. So I had a part-time well, job as a waitress in high school. Um, there wasn't a lot of really interesting jobs in Prince George. Um, and when I was in uni, I thought I might want to um, go into social work or psychology. So I did work experience in a, an acute care psych psychiatric ward, which scared the living daylights out of me and actually made me depressed. So I changed um, my department that I, I went from sort of psychology into political science and econometrics, where I feel that felt can a lot also happier. make you very depressed. Uh, it can, <laughs> particularly. <laughs> Uh, in June of last year, um, but, um, but you or know, November so, for some or, of us. Or, or, or yes, or in November, <laughs> yes, exactly. But was there so, a light bulb moment? Um, was there something that suddenly said, "Right, this is what's helped me understand what my, I might want to be"? Well, well, my light bulb moment was, yeah, I did it, and I didn't like it. So I think trying things that you may not like is really important, and that's why a week for the, either the student or for the business is not that big. It's not right. that big a deal. Um, but you know, but you know, longer a permanent role that you find you know you, you just don't like is terrible. Just, I go back to six years ago when we were thinking up Founders for Schools just for a sec, because we had thought, what is the conversion rate of our asks from a teacher of a business leader about whether or not they're coming to class? We thought it would be somewhere between 1 and 5 percent, but it's 25 to 50 percent. This is solving an issue, and it's giving a great opportunity for business leaders that they've been waiting, to, waiting for for a long time. So it's not we're not trying to create a market. We're actually facilitating a market that's already there. So that political science degree might have come in quite useful, because that's a great form of activism. Read your first bit of work experience. Did you, did you do any, or did you just go straight into building world-class companies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think, I think my first work experience was a newspaper route, which of course shows you how there's changes of industries and so forth, because I don't think that exists for young people in the U.S. as much anymore. Delivering newspapers on your bicycle, you know, uh, not for that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't work anymore. But that's that's good, and I think that was, and then uh, you know, to some degree, part of the thing that I think my both my parents emphasized was actually doing a variety of each summer of different kind of work experiences as a way of getting a map to which kinds of things resonated with me, which industries I was interested in. So it was everything from I worked on uh, you know kind of fishing boats in Alaska to uh, kind of doing map analysis at, at Standard Oil of Ohio to uh, working in, uh, in kind of IBM uh, in the AI lab. And would you put any of those experiences in terms of understanding of what you ultimately went on to do? Was there anything that gave you that insight, that sense of the person you might become? I think the primary thing was kind of realizing for myself, and it's not universal, is how much uh, software will be transforming industries and why software was one of the things to look at pretty carefully. And that's one of the things you'll see across a number of industries is the industry will persist, but software will transform it. Uh, and that that kind of transformation was mm -hmm. the, was the uh, 
area of the grab mic. And presumably work experience is the beginning of your own personal network in life. I mean, in terms of where, where you go forward with that. I mean, is that one of the soft skills that, that sort of, or, or, the, or the benefits people get out of it, Sherry? Well, we think? heard it from Gabby earlier. She learned, you know, that, you know to how, to, how, to, how to navigate in the workplace and that these people actually were pleasant to her and right. that she enjoyed it. Um, um, communication skills and how you communicate is a really important learnt. It doesn't necessarily come naturally to all of us, particularly if we're shy. Um, but, you, but if you want to get along, you have to communicate. And if what we're doing isn't written in books, so you have to network with others so that you can create the future that you want to live in. Now, I'm sure you two didn't meet through work experience, but how did you very quickly just, I'm sure everybody wants to know, <laughs> how, how, did the, how did sort of Reed and Sherry meet? I was introduced to Reed by Ellen Levy. And I was introduced to Ellen Levy, who by Laurie Yoler, who used to be a non-exec director on my board of the first company that I floated. And uh, we then met at TED um, yep. quite a long time ago. Well, let's not date it. But yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, we, we've got just a couple of minutes. So what I want to just focus on in terms of why people here should sort of take work finder seriously, why they why they should shine up. I mean, you, you're, you're advising um, work finding the project in terms of what comes up. Why did you get involved? I'm sure Sherry was very persuasive, but in terms of, <laughs> but in terms of and, and perhaps a call to action yeah. to our, our audience. Um, and obviously Sherry is very persuasive, but I think the, um, look, I think the key thing is, is the, the future is what we invent. Uh, what we invent individually, what we invent um, as uh, business people, um, and as all uh, kinds of different roles in society. And one of that key thing is that as industries are changing, uh, the nature of how you work effectively, which industries, which skills, et cetera. Uh, what you want to do when you're thinking about this as a business is say, okay, everything from how do I participate well in society to how do I have a high morale, vibrant workplace? Uh, bringing in folks to do projects is something that will add a lot of energy into your workplace. And so it's both a, a kind of a, the joy of doing something for society and something that's within your specific self-interest. And then for, uh, for young people, the key thing is it's no longer a, oh look, you know, it's, it's, it's one career, you kind of train for it, it's the industrial age, you work on that for the rest of your thing. Careers are changing constantly. It's much more like a jungle gym, right? So you're actually kind of swinging through the bars and different kinds of experiences. Jungle gym works as a metaphor here. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was just trying to translate it across the, pod, of the <laughs> pod. It was like, wait a minute, that works in the US. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, and, and so going out and getting some experiences is the best way to inform you about which kinds of things resonate with you, about the kinds of things that you would put on your CV that would enable the next job, and enable you to be learning constantly throughout your career, uh, both for what is it, the most interesting economic opportunities, but also what's, for me what's meaningful for you. Sherry, what's next? What do people need to take away from this morning in terms of Work Finder and the app? That they've got it in them to help solve this problem. I think this is a, the largest issue we have in our society. And it's up to us as a society and as individuals to, to solve it. So if you know a child that doesn't yet um, know how to navigate their future, um, tell them about it. If you have jobs or you've got other people in your company who can host these things, then encourage them to do it because together we can solve this. I always like to back people who are solving problems worth solving. This problem is worth solving. And it's solvable. There are solutions right now, right here, right in front of us. And why wait? There's um, children who have opportunities that they could chase. And otherwise, they might not feel the hope that I feel for the world. Sherry Keaty, Reid Hoffman, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.